Welcome to another video from explainingcomputers.com. This time I'm going to talk about random access memory or RAM. Specifically, I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about the nature and history of RAM before detailing those RAM technologies and form factors used in modern desktop and laptop computers. Computer storage can be volatile or non-volatile. Non-volatile storage includes hard drives and SSDs as these maintain their contents when power is disconnected. In contrast, modern RAM is volatile storage that loses its data when the power is switched off. RAM is, however, the fastest kind of storage available and is used to hold programs and data when a computer is running. RAM capacity is measured in gigabytes, with one gigabyte being just over one billion bytes. Today, four gigabytes is the minimum recommended RAM for a modern Windows PC, with eight gigabytes or more required for most video editing and other high-end applications. The first type of RAM to enter widespread use was magnetic core storage, which featured tiny ferrite rings that were threaded on a lattice of wires. By passing voltages through the wires, the rings or cores could be magnetised with either a clockwise or anti-clockwise polarity, so allowing the storage of one bit of data. Here you can see a magnetic core storage unit that I photographed at the National Museum of Computing. The unit has multiple planes of cores stacked one on top of the other, with the uppermost core plane visible through the window on the top. Core storage was the most common form of RAM from the mid-1950s to the mid-1970s, and was used in the Apollo spacecraft that took human beings to the moon. In the early 1970s, core storage started to be replaced with integrated circuit or IC RAM. Early personal computers were subsequently fitted with many dual inline or DIP RAM chips as we can see here. Such chips were usually plugged directly into sockets on the computer's motherboard, which made RAM repairs and upgrades rather time consuming. Even more significantly, chip creep could occur, with individual RAM chips having a tendency to rise out of their sockets due to constant thermal expansion and contraction. To overcome these limitations, RAM chips started to be soldered into packages or modules that were in turn plugged into a computer's motherboard. Two standards initially emerged, known as SIPs and SIMs. As you can see, a SIP, or single inline package, had 30 pins that plugged into a row of tiny round sockets. While great in theory, SIPs could be tricky to fit, were expensive to produce, and it was easy to bend or otherwise damage their pins. For this reason, SIMs, or single inline memory modules, became a dominant RAM technology. Like SIPs, these were initially available with a 30 pin form factor, although later SIMs had 72 pins, and sadly I don't have one of those available to show you here. As you can see, however, SIMs have a robust edge connector and securely clip and lock into a motherboard RAM socket. Today's computers are fitted with descendants of SIMs known as DIMMs or dual inline memory modules. The key difference between a SIM and a DIM is that the connections on either side of a SIM are duplicated, whereas on a DIM they are distinct, hence doubling the number of connection points in the same available space. For optimum performance, identical pairs of DIMMs should be installed into matching slots or banks on a computer's motherboard. This allows the RAM to run in a so termed dual channel mode that maximises the speed at which it can be accessed. Motherboards that can accommodate more than two DIMMs almost always have their RAM slots colour coded to indicate appropriate insertion pairs. As we'll see later in the video, over the years DIMMs have evolved to accommodate speed improvements. It should also be noted that whilst all of the DIMMs shown here are for use in a desktop PC, smaller DIMMs or small outline dual inline memory modules are used in laptops and other small computers. For completeness, I should also note that in the late 1990s and early noughties there was also another form of RAM called the RIM or Rambus inline memory module. These were similar to DIMMs but are no longer in use.
RAM can be confusing because the specification of a modern DIMM is pretty extensive and may be expressed in many different ways. For example, the specification for the RAM module we have here could be listed like this. Clearly, the 4GB at the front means that we have a 4GB component, and as I've already explained, the DIMM part on the end means that this is a dual inline memory module suitable for use in a desktop PC. We can also see the RAM bit sitting there quite happily, but with the letters S and D before it. And to explain what this and the other terms here mean, we need to delve a little deeper into RAM technologies. The memory cells that store each bit of information in a RAM chip can be either static or dynamic. In static RAM, or SRAM, each memory cell consists of four or more transistors that maintain data for as long as power is applied. In contrast, in dynamic RAM, or DRAM, each memory cell is built from a single transistor and a capacitor that requires a periodic power refresh. Because SRAM does not have to be constantly refreshed, it is faster. However, SRAM is more expensive to manufacture than DRAM because more components are required to make up each memory cell. Because of this, SRAM is used to provide microprocessors and hard drives with some very fast internal storage called cache. However, most other computer RAM uses DRAM technology to provide the highest capacity for the lowest cost. Specifically today, personal computers are fitted with SDRAM memory modules. SDRAM is a development of DRAM which stands for Synchronous Dynamic RAM. What this means is that SDRAM operates in synchronization with the computer's clock cycle, which reduces wait times for the processor and hence improves performance. Back in 2000, a development of SDRAM called DDR SDRAM was introduced. DDR stands for Double Data Rate and means that the RAM operates twice as quickly as two data transfers take place per clock cycle rather than just one. Since it was introduced, DDRS DRAM has been improved several times with subsequent generations called DDR2, DDR3 and DDR4. At the time of making this video in December 2018, a new standard for DDR5 is awaited with DDR5 S DRAM likely to enter the market in 2019 or 2020. Later generations of DDRS DRAM offer increasingly higher performance and have different physical form factors. Specifically, at the top here, we have a first generation full size DDRS DRAM with 184 pins, and below that, a DDR2 module with 240 pins. Next, there is a DDR3 S DRAM which also has 240 pins, but which has a notch in a different location to prevent it from being inserted into a DDR2 socket. Finally, we have a DDR4 SD RAM with 288 pins and again a different notch configuration. Note that the DDR3 and DDR4 modules here are supplied with an aluminium heat spreader to help cool their chips, but that this is not always the case. RAM modules in each DDR generation are available in a range of speeds. Here, for example, we're looking at a table showing common speeds for different DDR3 SD RAM modules. As you can see, RAM speed can be expressed in several different ways, with a data rate cited in megatransfers per second and an associated peak transfer rate listed in megabytes per second. As we can see, the megatransfers per second figure may also be combined with a module's DDR type, while the peak transfer rate is often included within a module label that is prefixed with PC and the DDR generation. Note that it's not uncommon for an SDRAM's data rate to be cited in megahertz, even though megatransfers per second is more technically correct. Each generation of DDRS DRAM was developed to offer higher performance than the previous one, and to illustrate this, here's a table of common DDR4 modules which are clearly faster than the DDR3 modules we've just seen. When looking at such data, note that the peak transfer rate figure in megabytes per second is always 8 times higher than the data transfer rate expressed in megatransfers per second. Note also that there are no definitive terms in use for the headings shown in these tables, with variations on the wording used by different manufacturers and standards bodies. I'm now very aware that I've presented rather a lot of information, and I could go on to detail even more RAM terminology. However, I think we've now had enough to make sense of a standard RAM module specification. 
And so, if we return to the component we had previously, it's hopefully now clear that its specification refers to a 4 gigabyte module based on 4th generation double data rate synchronous dynamic RAM. We can also see that the module operates with a data transfer rate of 2400 mega transfers a second, equating to a peak transfer rate of 19200 megabytes a second. And finally, we also know that this RAM before us has a dual inline memory module form factor. So, what do you need to know when selecting RAM for a PC build or upgrade? Well, without delving into even more technicalities, the key things to note are as follows. Firstly, desktop PCs require DIMMs and laptops require SODIMMs. Secondly, you need to fit the correct DDR generation for your motherboard as there's no backwards or forwards compatibility. So, for example, you must fit DDR3 RAM into a DDR3 motherboard, DDR4 RAM into a DDR4 motherboard, and so on. Thirdly, you should fit RAM with a speed that is supported by your motherboard. All motherboards accept several different module speeds, so make sure that the RAM you get is suitable for your board. Finally, where the option is available, obtain dual channel performance by fitting identical pairs of RAM modules according to the colour coding of your RAM slots and the instructions in your motherboard's manual. Back in the early 1980s, the first computer that I owned and programmed was this one, a Sinclair ZX81, and this has got one kilobyte of RAM. And given that modern computers have gigabytes of RAM, this means that modern computers have over a million times more RAM than the first machine I ever used and programmed. And that I find absolutely extraordinary. And it makes me speculate on the fact that the chances are that many of you watching this video right now will end up owning computers that have got terabytes and even petabytes of RAM. And we can only imagine what that amount of RAM will actually be used for in the future. But now that's it for another video. If you enjoyed what you've seen here, please press that like button. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. And I hope to talk to you again very soon. Oh.